Hi, a very good afternoon to everyone. I know it's not easy to always have a session immediately after lunch on a Wednesday afternoon. So let me try to make this as interesting as possible. I will do my best. Um, and today we'll be talking to you and sharing with you on how you can improve your research visibility as well as your research impact. Um, my name is Nicholas. I'm based in Singapore and I'm the customer consultant um, for Southeast Asia. I've been with Elsevier for approximately six over years now, and I've been working with institutions in Malaysia throughout this entire period of time. So it's really my pleasure to work with you. And some of you um, are the ones that I've worked with before. It's great to see you all. Um, otherwise, it's nice meeting you for the first time. In today's session, I'll be walking you through these key topics. Um, I'll do a brief introduction on the quality of journals on Scopus. I'll be walking you through on how and what you should do to get your work to be noticed and how you can get it published. The next couple of sections will be a bit drier because we'll be talking about metrics and not everyone always loves metrics, but it's absolutely imperative. So I'll be talking you through on how you can understand Scopus journal metrics. And then next will be in terms of the application, in terms of how you can track your citations on Scopus. And I'll be sharing with you some interesting things like topics of prominence and other research tools. So I think this is actually something very interesting. Um, yeah, stay tuned. Any point in time, if you have any questions, um, type them into the chat box or the Q&A chat box so it's easier for me to monitor what your queries are. Before we go on further, I want to actually walk you through on what we call a, a research roadmap because I'm assuming most of you are researchers and you probably want to know what is the best track for you to, um, to for your work to be noticed and for, for your work to, to maximize the impact of your work. So it comes in seven different stages, right? In terms of ideation, in terms of planning, how you can design your research thesis and question, how you can write it, how you can promote it, and how, how you can publish it, how you can promote it, and how you can track it. It comes across different things, right? So under ideation, you want to ask yourself, how is it possible for you to understand research topics, how you can identify trends, how you can link research with patterns. In terms of planning, you want to know what types of research you're conducting, right? And how you may want to work with collaborators and how you can find funding bodies. When you're designing your thesis, you want to ask yourself, what are the queries you want to ask? how you're able to find the right references and how you can manage it. Writing is of course the most challenging part and the most time, time consuming part. So you want to take adequate care in, in the preparation, right? Um, you want to know what are the key points you're addressing and how you can approach collaborative writing. I'll be talking how you can find the right journal to get your work to be published because it's very important. And today I'll also be talking about how you can identify key metrics in journals. Next stage will be how you can improve and increase your research visibility, how you can increase your profile as a researcher. And we'll be talking about the publishing and promotion component today, as well as the tracking and how you can access your performance and how you can communicate your performance to your research stakeholders, right? So this is really strong emphasis in today's session. Before we go on further, um, I want to see, and I want to just showcase to you on how most of you will be able to leverage this on Scopus. Scopus is the world's largest abstract indexing databases. We work together with over 7,000 publishers um, to index from over 25,000 serial titles. We have access to up to 84 million items. You can discover over 17 million author profiles as well as 80,000 affiliations. A very key component on Scopus would be what we call research metrics. We have input metrics, we have um, process metrics, and then we have output and outcome metrics. Today's session, we'll be sp speaking primarily on output and outcome metrics, where you're able to understand and to identify how you can get your work to be published, how you can get your work to be disseminated, right? How you can get your work published, how you can get viewed, and how you can be cited. So this is really the emphasis in today's session. So some of you will be asking, what are research outputs, right? And it comes in man, many different formats. Um, there are up to 67 types of what we call as artifacts. 
And you probably may want to measure it all in terms of articles, theses, books, conference papers, reports, reviews, book chapters, documents, videos, and any others, right? There's so many different types. Um, your work will come out in all these different formats. So we're not saying that there's only one fixed format in terms of a research article. There are many different ways for you to track your impact in terms of research. These are some of the overall government bodies that whom we work with and we collaborate with, right? Um, within Asia Pacific, we have Nanyang Technological University. We have the National Research Foundation in Korea, TCI in Thailand, Beijing University. In terms of a global level, we work together with QS University Rankings, Times Higher Education, Shanghai Xiao Tong, um, Nikkei, as well as um, Polish ranking bodies. How we actually index journals on Scopus is due and we work with a bunch of very established um, subject experts from over the world. This is what we call and whom we call the Content Selection and Advisory Board. They are not part of Elsevier, so they are also not part of, say, Scopus. They are a completely independent body, right? And they are the ones who decide whether or not a journal is good enough to be indexed in Scopus. We understand that there is a lot of queries with regards to predatory journals recently in Malaysia. Um, and something we want to clarify is that Scopus is committed to creating a representative curated data set of scholarly content. The journal selection is based on journal level data and performance. We monitor and we deselect titles that are predatory or below standards. The one thing that we can't do is that we cannot intervene with editorial autonomy of journals they are based on the quality of individual articles and conferences. The content and abstracts are always included in the database, but we cannot intervene on a behavioral level. So if there's plagiarism and publication malpractice, we cannot intervene. We cannot intervene in the authorship of the paper, right? Um, if you ever notice that there is a publication malpractice um, happening, do let us know, right? And Scopus will flag, reevaluate, and then potentially discontinue titles that are predatory. And when it comes to predatory definitions, it's a bit great because there is no fixed um, definition for predatory journals. Um, it has been contentious for a long time, but it was only really recently in 2019 um, where a group of researchers met to define what predatory publishing is, and they are able to reach a consensus definition on this, right? So predatory journals and predatory publishers essentially are entities who prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship, they are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices, right? Um, so a very key part of this statement are entities which prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship. So one thing that we do notice is that people will be looking at a scope and say, how come there are journals which do not seem to be performed very well? Um, straightforward. Poor quality journals have lower than average performance, but they can still be relevant to be covered in Scopus, right? Uh, there are journals which are niche, which are very unique. Research published in these journals um, could be of high quality, and the journals do not necessarily have to be removed from Scopus, right? Because there is still value to the research content yet. It doesn't mean that there is no citations, therefore it's a bad journal. It doesn't work that way. But the one thing that we do observe is that predatory journals itself, right? These are the ones that are threat to science and they have to be avoided to be covered in Scopus. Um, journals which are included in Scopus benefit from wider global visibility and the resulting increase in terms of impact and quality. And sometimes this doesn't happen and the journal may become predatory, right? When you're making decisions about research, you need to base these decisions on data that you can trust. So predatory journals are a threat to the integrity of Scopus and science in general. And because predatory journal publishing is ill-defined and subject to personal interpretation, um, independent reviews of individual journals by academic subject experts in each field is essential. One of the key things that we do on Scopus is that we always do what we call a rigorous re-evaluation process and criteria. Um, not all journals submitted to Scopus are indexed, right? It's very strict. So every single year, we have about 3,500 suggestions on average. Only 40% meet the minimum criteria, and only 46% of this are accepted after 
um, the review period. So about 630 titles meet the full Scopus criteria, which really amounts to approximately about one sixth of it, right? If you think about it. And it doesn't mean that once you're indexed on Scopus, you're there for perpetuity. It's not the case. There is a very rigorous re-evaluation process. Um, one thing that we do do is that approximately um, 263 titles will be re-evaluated and half of them um, will be discontinued moving forward with the other half staying on. These are some of the ways that we re-evaluate the titles from the past five years. Um, about 44% were flagged for publication concerns and about only and more than half were discontinued. 33% were flagged for underperformance and they were discontinued as well. So you can see some of the key things and the metrics that we look at for Scopus. We, have, we do this through a, a range of journal metrics and benchmarking tools in terms of self citation rate, total citation rate, site score analytics, article counts, clicks on Scopus and abstract usage. Um, and we also have a radar where we identify outlier journals in terms of the Scopus database, where we track and we observe whether or not a publication um, number in a journal has increased, right? So there will be outlier journal examples, which includes rapid and unexplainable changes to number of articles published or unexplainable changes in geographical diversity of authors or affiliations. Um, the tool would improve continuously by new examples or rules, and they will check once a year, checking the full Scopus um, journal base of 2,500 titles. Journals flagged by the radar would be, then be added to the re-evaluation process. They'll be evaluated in terms of whether or not the journal deserves to be um, carried on to be indexed within Scopus. We also listen to our community um, when in, there are publication concerns. A journal can be flagged for re-evaluation based on the concerns on either publisher or journal level. Concerns for these journals are identified by Scopus or flagged to Scopus by the research community, and they are taken very seriously. If the concern is legitimate, the title will be added to the re-evaluation program and re-evaluated by the CSAB in the year of identification. The one question people always ask is that, um, how do we know if a journal is indexed on Scopus or otherwise? And my answer is actually very straightforward. Go and download the Scopus source list and you'll be able to see which journals are currently active in Scopus or which have been discontinued. Do this, and one thing that we have done and changed recently is that we have made this a monthly update. So if you're not sure what the current status of Scopus is, please tune in and check it every single month. This is the best possible way for you to do so. Okay, the next question, how can, what can you do to get your work noticed, right? And I think one of the most key areas is that for you, you need to actually publish this, um, publish your work in an optimal journal. So always ask yourself questions. Um, ask your colleagues and your peers, what are their recommendations to get your work to be published in or which journal? Sometimes you may be speaking to your supervisor, your mentor, and sometimes you'll be reading authors, right? And when you're reading authors, you probably notice that they publish in certain journals. Ask yourself if these journals are the area or the journal platform that you want to be published in. Alternatively, book a consultation with the USM librarians. They are very good at what they do, and they will be able to point you in the right direction as well. If you want to be more um, independent, you can take a look at the articles that where you have um, the articles you have cited and see where they actually have been published. You can also note the journals reference in the bibliography of key papers in your field, see which journals they are primarily coming from, and you can also look for authors in your field and to understand which journals they are currently publishing in. One thing that we always do is that we always encourage you to think of where, what is your end in mind, right? So think of what is it that you actually want to achieve with your research article. Um, and it comes across different forms. Ask yourself, what is the format of the work that you're trying to publish in? Is it a review article? Is it a new article? Or is it a conference proceeding, right? And then you need to identify the best medium to get your work to be noticed because that's the best way for your work to resonate with your readers, right? You want to make sure that your work is published in the area where the readers want to read what you're writing about. In this case, then it resonates stronger with them, right? It has to align. It needs to, to have a, a similar starting point, so as to speak. The next question is, do you want or is there a need for you to publish in terms of open access? 
um, do your funders provide you with the grant where you can pay for the APC? Or if they don't, then perhaps you don't need to publish in the Go Open Access Journal. You can just publish it in what we call a subscription journal. Next point is that you need to see um, if you're seeking a title with a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary focus, you want to make sure that you're able to actually um, publish together with a specific publisher. You need to ask yourself, is there a need for me to publish with one publisher per se, maybe IEEE or maybe Elsevier or maybe Springer, et cetera. Ask yourself if you're also publishing research data or other outputs alongside the article as well. So seven key things that you want to consider as you're evaluating the journals, right? Ask yourself, is my manuscript the right fit? Are there any institutional or funder mandates that I have to consider? Is the journal very visible in the communities that I want to reach out to? So there was an editor I spoke to previously and asked him, you know, how are you interested in open access journals or how do you decide which journals that you're primarily reading? And it's, his answer was very simple, right? He doesn't care if it's open access or not. He just wants to get his work published in the journal that his community is reading in, right? Because that's the the landmark journal that everyone in a specific research area would tend to gravitate towards. And that's the community. In that case, when you publish in that kind of journal, it just means that your work is more visible. People will be likely to cite your work if it's interesting. You need to ask yourself at the same time, is there a reasonable chance of acceptance, right? You can't just publish and say a Q1 journal or top 1% journal, and then, you know, my work is done because you know you think that your work is good enough to be accepted. You need to also know what's the threshold and what your standards are. Um, in this case, you always want to make sure that your work has a very good chance of being accepted by the journal, right? So you need to do your homework as well and be very honest with yourself, right? Um, sometimes, and being Asians in general, we always undersell ourselves. I would say sometimes you know it's okay to try overreaching a little, right? You need to understand where this um this line is. Ask yourself if the journal is indexed in the relevant databases, like say Scopus or Web of Science. And then this is the part where we will be going to more detail is what do the journal metrics review and what exactly is it that they're telling you? The last part that I'll ask you is that make sure that the journal that you're submitting to is reputable, they practice a very robust peer review standards, and they are also not predatory journals, right? Seven key steps, right? Um, I would think that it's, and most of the time, it really is, it sounds much more simpler than it is. We all know that it's actually not so um, straightforward, but my job here is to make sure and distill down the seven key essence here so that you're actually able to capture this as you're evaluating a journal for you to publish in and therefore make your work more noticeable. So the next part that I want to talk to you and share with you is in terms of Scopus journal metrics. Um, in terms of scope metrics in Scopus, people will always say that, hey, Nicholas, there's so many metrics on Scopus. What exactly is what? And isn't it too complicated? Well, this is what I'm here for. My job is to make it simpler for you to understand. So there are a couple of metrics at a different level for each person, right? Um, in terms of an author level or a researcher level, we have what we call a document count where you're able to see your output and we are also able to see the H index in terms of an author level. I'll go into this more uh, into more detail later during the session itself. We also have article level. We are able to see the citation count. We are able to see the citations per paper. You're able to see the few weighted citation impact. We can see the outputs in the top quarter of the journals. We can see the citations in terms of policy and medical guidelines. We can track your usage, your captures, your mentions, and social media. This is what we call Plum X and Alt metrics. I'll show this to you later as well. On a journal level, we have site score, we have Simago journal ranking, and source normalized impact per paper. I put in journal impact factor because this may be a metric that most of you may be more familiar and comfortable with, but it's not the only metric. It's not a metric that we have on Scopus. So two key rules that we want to talk about when it comes to Scopus, right? Two golden rules. Um, always use both qualitative and quantitative input and outputs into your decision itself. And you should always use more than one research metric as the quantitative input, right? Two golden rules that we abide to very closely within Scopus itself. So it's not, 
It's really about benefiting from the strengths of both approaches and not about one or the other, which is why when it comes to Scopus, people will ask us, do you have a blacklist or do you have a whitelist? We don't, right? Because we know that research is much more intricate and complicated than that. So it's about benefiting from the strengths of both approaches. Combining both approaches will get you closer to the entire story. And intelligence is available from the points where these approaches may differ from their message. Um, we always use more than one research metric because a metric's strength can complement the weakness of others. There are many different ways of being excellent and using multiple metrics would drive very desirable, desirable changes in terms of the behavior as well. So when it comes to research metrics, they can be used to analyze the strengths of research at an institution or at a research lab, or maybe the strength of an individual. You can ascertain which research is a good area for you to delve into. Um, people will be able to understand the ROI in terms of the research. You can identify rising stars amongst early career researchers, and you can talk and tell a better narrative about everything that's happening on with regard to research. So these are some different ways um, that we have, right? And um, we have what we call a quick reference card for research impact metrics. How you can prioritize reading, how you can identify where to publish in, how you can add to your research profile, how you can enrich your PNT portfolio, how you can develop your research collections, and how you can benchmark a collection of research outputs. There is really a lot to go over through, go through over here, but I'll be covering this in the session itself. But if you want more details, you can easily access over here, libraryconnect.elsevier.com in terms of the library and quick reference cards for research impact metrics. Sometimes you also want to know why is a good way to showcase research metrics, right? Um, do you want to put in author X published in 2012? And you can talk about your citations, your Twitter mentions, your Mendeley bookmarks, and your blog mentions. But this is like stating it, right? Not presenting. Um, the impact of the work that you have done. So maybe in terms, instead of showing this, you can talk about, this is my citations, right? I have 17 citations, but it's in the top 5% in economics research on Scopus. This shows the impact of your research rather than just seeing pure numbers because numbers without correlation or without um, a reference point doesn't tell the impact of the story that you want to say. You can talk about your international impact, right? You have been mentioned, bookmarked, or viewed in over 40 countries. And then you can talk about how your paper has been covered by 10 media outlets, including the BBC and the Wall Street Journal. Um, it was recommended in research blogs and described in tweets by prominent researcher as a significant step forward in our understanding. This is a very good example on how you can present research metrics to talk about the impact of the work that you have like, um, generated. So something that you might be interested to know. You also want to use multiple metrics to compensate or to understand weaknesses. So in Scopus, we have what we call a few weighted citation impact, which compensates for differences in fields, type, and age. The benchmark is built in. There is a benchmark being built in with one being the global average for subject area. But the problem here is that, well, people here may not like small numbers because you see 2.53, you're like, wow, it's only 2.53 as compared to 27.8. But you don't know what the reference point is, right? Um, it's not so easy to calculate and it doesn't showcase the magnitude in terms of total number of citations. But this is why we usually combine it together with the citations per publication. Um, it's easy for you to validate it. It communicates magnitude of activity. And in this case, it also the FWCI also helps to compensate for the CPP's um, problems, which you don't know what's the benchmarking standards, right? So which is why we talk about using multiple metrics because now you're able to have a better understanding, contextual understanding in terms of what the metrics mean. We have many different metrics here on Scopus, site score, site score percentile, citation count, document count, percent cited, SNP and SJL. I'll go through this later and how you can take a quick look on this um, in the next couple of slides. There is many different types of journal metrics that you can leverage on to uh, engage the community, to understand con uh, contributions, to understand consumption patterns, to understand scholarly impact as well as social impact, 
right? So this is something that you may want to take a look at after the session itself to get a better contextual understanding and knowing how you can apply different metrics for different purposes. We have over 30 sets of metrics at your disposal over in Scopus itself, but I don't really want to overwhelm you with this. So I'm going to touch upon three key metrics that you may have heard me mention um, over the past half hour. Firstly, we have site score, which gives a, a comprehensive, transparent, and current view of a journal's impact. Site score is developed by Elsevier. It uses a four-year citation window, and it's calculated by citations divided by documents from similar types. I'll give you a visual representation of this shortly. SNP is what we call a source normalized impact per paper. It measures contextual citation impact by weighting citations based on the total number of citations from a subject view. The impact of a citation is given higher value in subject areas where citations are less likely and vice versa. It's very similar to the few weighted citation impact, barring one major differences. FWCI is applicable to an article level, but SNP is calculated at specifically only a journal level. The next one we have is Simago Journal Ranking, which is a prestige metric applied to journals, book series, and conference proceeding. Um, with SJL, the subject view, the quality, and the reputation have a direct effect on the value of a citation. It scores an average of one for easy comparison. This is how Citate Score 2020 is calculated. We count the citations received in 2017 to 2020 to articles, reviews, conference papers, book chapters and data papers from the same four years, and it's divided by the number of publications published in 2017 to 2020. It provides clarity, currency, and comprehensiveness. And on the other hand, we have SJL, which is developed by the Simago Journal Labs, Simago Labs. They use Scopus as the data source for the development of the SJL indicator because Scopus um, well, being the largest AI database, is able to look at science at a global scale. As mentioned, SGL looks specifically as the prestige of the journal. So it's indicated by considering the sources to, of the citations to read rather than the popularity as measured by counting all citations equally because not all citations are the same, right? Um, a citation received by a journal is assigned a weight based on the prestige of the citing journal. A citation from a journal with high SJL value is of course worth more than a citation from a journal with low SJL value. So it's really rewarding the quality of the work that's being published, right? Because citations coming from highly important journals are more valuable. They will therefore generate more prestige to the journals receiving them. SJL normalizes for differences in citation behavior between subject fields. So for instance, life sciences, there will be more journals. So if you have high impact and many citations, one citation in a way represent less value because it's so easy to get citations from a popular topic. But on the other hand, it just means that in a topic like arts and humanities, where it's more difficult for you to get citations, a citation also represents higher value. So it really depends in terms of prestige, per se in terms of quality of journal, as well as the, um, the easiness of how readily accessible uh, a subject topic is. And this is a very good example, right? Um, when you go to say the source list in terms of um, Scopus, you'll be able to see all of these metrics, the site score, the SGL and the SNP. You'll also be able to see all of the information in terms of the site score 2020 and the site score tracker 2021. Site score 2020 is what we call fixed value. Um, the tracker itself is a dynamic value. It keeps you up to date on when the last uh, update was, right? So you'd be able to know when this is the case. So one thing that I also encourage you to do is that please go over to Scopus. Remember just now earlier, I was speaking to you on how you can observe to get your work to be published. This is a very good example on how you can do so, right? Go to the journal sources, take a look at the journal, look at the key journals within your area, compare it to the subject category, and you'll be able to see what the top 10 journals in that category are. So Lancet is very strong in terms of general medicine. You want to publish a medicine article, what are the top 10, right? You see the Lancet. 
you see New England Journal of Medicine, you see Nature Reviews Primus, you see Lancet Global Health, you see JAMA, the Journal of American uh, Medical Association. These are the top five journals, right, within general medicine that you may or may not want to get your work to be published in. Then compare it accordingly, right? It's a really useful tool for you to do so. But this doesn't just stop there. I will always encourage you to compare, say, three different journal sources for you to understand how they perform um, in relative to one another. So if I were to take a look at site score, right, I want to take a look at Lancet. I see Lancet performing very well. And then we can see in this case, followed by New England Journal of Medicine and then JAMA. And then when we see Symago, you see that the performance is also a bit different because the way they calculate is different, right? Then this is where you make your own comparison because we don't really want to just talk, extol the virtues of just one type of metric, right? Different metrics do different purposes. SJL tracks in terms of a prestige calculation. SNP tracks in terms of a few weighted perspective, right? So their performances will all differ from one another. If you want to talk about raw count in terms of citations, we can see that um, New England Journal of Medicine has the most number of citations. And at the same time, they, all three journals publish more or less equivalent number of uh, source documents per year. The other metric that I really like is what we call the percent not cited. Percent not cited shows how many percent um, within a journal that the work is not being cited or being read or being used by anyone. So if you're an early career researcher, you probably want to publish in a journal where the percent not cited is actually low and not high per se, right? It just makes perfect sense that way. You can also take a look, and if you want to take a look at how many percent of a journal are review articles, you can also take a quick look at it. And one thing that I will also share is that um, review articles tend to generate a higher number of citation counts. Um, so don't be surprised if a journal with a high percentage review articles also tend to generate more citation counts for less documents published. Okay, so the one thing that I want to talk about and I, I want to summarize for you here before we go into the practicalities of it is how exactly do metrics help, right? It's not all metrics or no metrics when you are deciding um, on this because it's not a black and white decision. It's not so straightforward. Metrics can provide data points where you can build using an expert opinion through peer review or to delve deeper and to deal with outliers. Also, one more thing that I want to really emphasize is that metrics aren't a replacement for human judgment. They are just really a tool for you to complement, for you to leverage on to make your own assessment. Many universities are currently adopting metrics and tools. We value objective, normalized, universal information because this now allow, allows you to do and to compare meaningfully with one another. And metrics aren't the antithesis of peer reviews. Bibliometrics incorporate decisions that are made by the peer review process, but it's not just only purely bibliometrics. So, and last but not least, when I'm sharing this with you is that you need to define the questions that you want to ask first, and then you'll be able to have the, the, the way to answer them accordingly. Okay. In terms of a practical ap explanation, um, application, sorry, how exactly are you able to track your citations on Scopus? My answer is actually very straightforward. So take a look under author profiles. There are two ways for you to search for authors on Scopus, right? So firstly, maybe if you have documents of a particular subject topic, you can, and you know the name of the authors, you can search for it. The other one is that if you know the name of the authors directly, right? So these are two different routes that you can do on Scopus. One, search for the authors directly, or two, look for the subject topic that you're interested in, and then you'll be able to see who the most prominent authors are within that subject field. I'm going to use an example of um, Professor Zainuraya um, from USM. And one thing that I want to showcase to you is that one, take a look at this professor. She's from USM. You'll be able to identify her ORCID ID, Part one. The other thing we talk about metrics, right? We talk about metrics, and then now you can see that she has published 687 documents and she has gotten 6,600 citations and with a H index of 37, which is really high. You'll be able to see her body of work through time. At the same time, you'll be able to see what her most contributed topics are, right? 
we'll go into topics shortly because that's another area for today's discussion. Now you'll be able to see she has published 687 documents. She has been cited by 4,765 documents and she has 425 co-authors, right? So potential people that you may want to work and to collaborate with. So before we go on further, remember earlier we were talking about some metrics like Twitter, how you are able to get and to track contextual application. This is a very good example of it. So we have what we call article level metrics. And I think this is really useful because they are comprehensive item level metrics that provides insights into the way people interact with individual pieces of research output. You're able to visualize scholarly engagement. Uh, and this includes five categories of metrics that are used to design and to communicate engagement without a score. So firstly, um, you can see usage, which are clicks, downloads, views, holdings, and video plays. You can see captures, right, which are bookmarks, quote forks, um, favorites, readers, watchers. You'll be able to also see um, mentions, which are blog posts and Wikipedia links. Blue represents social media, like likes, shares, and tweets. Red showcases citations, right? The citation counts, etc. And we present them in what we call a five leaf clover. We can see in this case, red is citations. Purple is captures, green is downloads, right? You can see how well this particular article in terms of an overview of growth kinetics, physical properties, and emission mechanisms, how well they've been performing. We can see that there's a lot of citations, a lot of usage, a lot of captures on Mendeley and EBSCO. We can see that it's been mentioned on Wikipedia, has been shared on Facebook, for instance, right? Now you can see the impact of the research article per se. So this is something that you may want to take a look at when it comes to author profiles, right? How you can track your citations, how you can see your performance as well. Leverage on both metric tools, I think it's really impo important and powerful for you to do so. The next thing that I want to share with you today is what we call topics of prominence. Okay, topics of prominence is really cool, right? Uh, I think it, it's one of those key things that it gives you a lot of insights, for you to understand um, which area that you may want to pursue your work in, it allows you to identify who you may want to collaborate with. So for Professor Zanuraya, she's published a lot of work in terms of pH sensors, in terms of yttrium aluminum garnets, as well as photo detectors, right? These are her key topics. The next question you'll be asking me is, hey, you know, what exactly are topics? I'm trying to answer for you now. A topic is basically a collection of documents with a common focus intellectual interest, right? And Scopus publications are clustered uh, into topics based upon a direct citation analysis. So what happens is that topics are basically, what happens is that, okay, so you all know that Scopus is the world's largest abstract indexing database with over 84 million items, right? What you may not know is that each article is broken down to maybe 64 different fields. We take a look at, say, um, the metadata and we pile it into a very big data machine. By breaking down into these fields, we are able to aggregate um, a lot of information. So a topic is essentially a collection of publications and they can be large or small, new or old, growing or declining. And there'll be new topics that would include. And because topics are dynamic, they will always evolve. And one publication can belong to only one topic and a topic can belong to only one topic cluster. So we look at what are the key topics within that research article itself. Some topics and topic clusters are created because we take the entire citation network with over 1 billion citation links between 55 million Scopus index publications from 96 onwards and an additional 20 million non-indexed documents that are cited at least twice. And we take the network into 96,000. Actually now it's about more because we've added more. So it's about like 100,000 topics. The topic is created where the direct citation linkage within the topic are strong and the direct citation linkage outside the topic are weak, right? And only index publications are included in topics. And this is how it looks like, right? All topics that class all publications in Scopus are clustered into topics using direct citation analysis as opposed to co-citation analysis, right? Because we're looking for one document per se. 
the borders between the clusters are identified by looking at where the citation links are weak, right? When the, the links are weak, the clusters are then split into separate topics. The other thing that we want to talk about is topics of prominence, right? So you know what topics are? Prominence as an indicator in terms of the momentum or the movement or the visibility of a particular topic, right? Prominence doesn't mean it's important, right? Because importance, of course, will take on a different magnitude. What prominence really means is how visible it is at the moment. So calculating a topic's prominence combines three metrics. We take a look at the citation count in the year published of the paper. We take a look at the scopus view counts in the year. And we take a look at the average site score for the year, right? This is how topics of prominence are like. And these are some of the topic prominence uh, for Professor Zainu Raya. She's very strong in terms of uh, pH census and gates. So we can see in terms of the documents that she has published in, we can see the few weighted citation impact, right? Photo detectors is something she's very active in and she has pub her work is 27% higher than the global average. In terms of lithium ion batteries and nano ribbons, hers is 14% higher than the global average. And in terms of curcumin and turmeric extract, her work is 48% higher than the global average. So it's a very good way for you to explore. You can learn more about topics that you may have not known previously um, and how you can explore in greater depth and detail. So in other words, what you can do is that you can take a look at say some key researchers in your field, take a look and I mean, it's a bit like stalking them right online. So you can want to follow them, take a look at their, the quality of the work that they have published, take a look at the impact of this, of their work, and then we can go very specifically down into the topics per se. I think this is a really powerful tool. I really like this. I think um, most of the time when you want to find out more and how you can be more in-depth in terms of collaboration, this is another way for you to do so. So yeah, please leverage on this, on what I've shared with you with regards specifically on topics of prominence. In the meantime, I realized, okay, um, this has been really quiet so far. So please stop typing in any questions or queries you have in the Q&A box and I'll address them towards the end of the session. But before we do that, I want to share more information and resources with you, right? Um, first and foremost, Scopus always updates our updates very regularly on the Scopus blog. And then you'll be able to find out what are the latest changes and what are the new and improved Scopus functionality that have come in place. We also have a Scopus blog, right? We can talk about it and we can give you frequent um, tweets and retweets as well on the latest information too. For librarians like Inject Kamal, um, you may be interested to join the Library Connect newsletter. Um, it covers library and information sciences, best practices, issues, technologies, and trends. This is a program from Elsevier for academic, medical, and corporate government librarians. So you'll be able to find information like how you can establish the library as a value research support partner. You can find and join the Library Connect Academy. And interestingly and importantly, um, how you can manage the Scopus organizational profiles for complex institutions. One of my favorite tool to use is the Elsevier Journal Finder. I always talk about this in every workshop I conduct because I think it's that useful. So if any of you here want to publish in an Elsevier journal, but you don't know um, which journal is good for you, go to the journal finder. Um, you can use the Elsevier fingerprint engine and they will use a smart search technology and few of research vocabularies to match your article to Elsevier journals. So key in the paper title, the abstract, the keywords, and the field of research, right? And from here, you'll be able to generate a list of Elsevier journals that you may be interested in, right? The Journal of Cleaner Production is something that uh, is one of the most popular journals where Malaysian authors have published in. Um, you can find out more information about it. You can find out the site score, the impact factor, the acceptance rate of the journal, right? The time to the first decision and the time to publication. And because you can see that there is OA option here, you can publish Go Open Access with this for an APC fee. This is something that you do. The other thing that we have is what we call the Elsevier Researcher Academy. Um, this is an online platform where you are able to participate in different phases of the research cycle, right? Um, it's a thing of it like basically a researcher version of Coursera. 
It addresses you for your careers, either inside or outside of academia. It shows how you can get funding for your research and how more of your papers can be accepted in top journals. And this is a completely free service. You'll be able to find different topics like research preparation, how you can write for research, what is the publication process like, how you can navigate the peer review and how you can communicate your research. So remember the seven different cycles that I was talking about initially, circles that I was talking about initially at the start of the, of the session for today. If you want to have more details about different components and stages of it, feel free to go over to Researcher Academy and you'll be able to get the details for this information. You'll probably find it very useful for you. Okay, so in the meantime, we have over here a survey for you to complete in and to join. And then what you have to do is to type in the certificate code to redeem the certificate for today's um, session. So the floor is completely open now for the questions and answers. And I see that I have a few questions and I'll do my best to actually address it. Okay, so firstly, as a new PhD student, how can I find and submit um, conference journal papers? So I would say first and foremost, uh, for Xiaohui, what you may want to do actually is to identify the conferences that are very, the most relevant for your research topic, right? And I'm sure you know which topics are, which conferences are, are, are very visible for you. If not, please speak to your um, instructor, your colleagues and your peers which are the most prominent conference ones. Sometimes convenience might not be the best way to do it as well. Think about it. You need to see which one is the most prominent and the visible one for your field. So this is what I would encourage you to do first, right? Identify which are the most prominent conferences areas and then maybe decide if you may want to participate in it where it gives you and generates for you the best visibility. So do researchers need to promote their works directly via social media like Facebook or Twitter for better visibility, I would say why not, right? Um, it depends on how active you are. It depends on, and I think more importantly, you may want to promote it within the community that is most active. And if you feel that the community is not active, then that's a great opportunity for you to grow and to make it uh, very interesting, right? I mean, we are in the generation of social media where it's very important for you to promote yourself. And I think that, um, you need to be able to do it in a very tasteful way, right? Where you're sharing information uh, in a very um, gregarious fashion and manner. So this is something that you probably want to do. So yes, if you have your research work and you think that there is actual value to it, make sure that you're, there's a way to, hmm, there is a good way of promoting it and its applications. In this case, this would resonate better to the audience that are looking at it. Okay, this one is a very real question. I get this very often. If my paper is accepted in the journal, which was Index and Scopus, but it was then discontinued before indexing the paper, what can you do as an author? I think in this case, it's really, really unfortunate to say, but um, there's not much that you can really do about it. The only thing I can really say is that moving forward, you probably have to just take a lot of care. And I would say in general, right? Like you spend about six months to a year doing your research. Um, it's really unfortunate that the, the journal itself is discontinued. Um, I would say that you probably will want to find a good journal, um, a very optimal journal to, to look into to publish it first. Um, be it say a Q1, quarter one or quarter two journal, you need to make sure that the journal itself um, is of a quality standard, which is why you tend to want to publish it with reputable publishers. Um, if there's a reason why the journal was discontinued, you should reach out to the editors and the publishers to find out about what exactly happened as well so that you know we can learn from it. Unfortunately, I can't really help you on this and I must apologize for the inconvenience that it must have, must have caused you. And I'm really sorry about that. Okay, so um, someone is asking with regards to what is Scopus H index and how it works. Actually, that's a very good question. Um, first and foremost, you need to understand what H index means, right? Um, H index is essentially a median uh, count of an author's work. So what it means is that there are many ways to calculate, and there's a, there's an age long question, right? How do you calculate a, a researcher's impact? Do you look at the top most cited work? Do you look at the volume of the cited work? And the answer isn't this or that, but as a matter of fact, it's rather in between it, right? Um, how you want to see a researcher's 
value and contribution to a research field would be to see what is the median in terms of productivity as well as quality of it. So when you're saying specifically on Scopus H index, what we do do is that we calculate it. The total, not the total, it's not an app a summation or division per se, right? So we are looking at say the median body of work of Scopus index work, where we can see where the author's work, volume of work and the citation count of that work is. In this case, we are able to ascertain how consistent that researcher's work is and the value is as well. So hopefully that explains it for you. You'll be able to take a quick look at it. What are the characteristics of Q1 journal based on Scopus or other publications based on my experience? I think I should have a presentation slide on this. Give me one quick second and I'll blow it up for you. So this is something that I did previously for USM as well, right? But um, in terms of the overall selection criteria, I want to walk you through this. Before a journal can be accepted into Scopus, all these titles, they need to meet all technical criteria to be considered for the review. You need to be peer reviewed, you need to have an English abstract, it needs to be published regularly, and it needs to have Roman script references and a publication ethics statement. Then it's broken down to 14 selection criteria that the CSAB would choose, right? In terms of journal policy, the quality of content, the journal standing, the publication regularity, and the online availability, right? In terms of um, a convincing aims and scope and editorial concept and policy, in terms of the types of peer review, in terms of the geographical distribution of editors and authors. This is under journal policy. Of course, then the quality of the content is the key part here, right? Um, how clear are the abstracts? Is it aligned with the aims and scope? Is there a strong academic contribution? And is it readable for within articles? The next part will be what are the citedness in terms of the journal articles in Scopus, the editorial standing. It has to be published regularity and it needs to be available online in terms of a homepage. So this is just part one and part two, right? So these are the common criteria that a journal would need to have before it is indexed in terms of Scopus. So hopefully that answers part of the question. And the other part of the question that I think you highlighted very interestingly is how do I understand which ones are Q1 and which ones are Q2 journals? In this case, let me showcase this example to you. So remember earlier we were talking about say Scopus, uh, about Lancet, right? In terms of the site score, and the size score rank and trend. What we take a look here is that we rank it accordingly in quartiles by site score counts according to say a subject area. So in this case, we are able to see site score 2020. We are able to count the number of citations to the documents. So this is something that we do do and we count, right? And then we are able to understand what the quartile, the quartile counts are. The next thing that I want to share with you is let's take a quick live demonstration, right? Because it's one thing to see it on a PowerPoint presentation, but it's another thing to actually see it when I'm doing it live. So let me share this with you on how we can take a quick search over it on terms of Scopus. And I believe we have a question, right? In terms of education, how do we see it from education? So let's take a quick look at sources. And then we can delve into it into more details. And I want to take a look at, say, specifically education in terms of my subject area. Sorry, I have to go to subject area and education. So in this case, it will be social sciences, or it could be development and educational psychology, right? It depends on um, which topic you're looking at. But let's take a look specifically under social sciences and education. And we find that there's actually a lot, there's up to 1300 articles in terms of education. And now if you want to take a look at, well, there was a question specifically on conference proceedings, right? So let's take a quick look at conference proceedings itself alone. And then we can find that there are three different types of proceedings here, right? That we index on Scopus in terms of frontiers in education conferences, 
uh, the proceedings in the ACM, as well as software engineering education conferences. Otherwise, you can deselect it, and then you can take a quick look at the full quartile. So sometimes you may even want to take a look at the first quartile or the second quartile, right? Um, I would say these are the top most journals that you're probably looking at, look, take a look at when it comes to say education. And now click on the first one that you may see at because that's probably the, the, the top most article, the top most prominent journal that we are observing at. We can see in this case, the Journal of Education Research has been indexed since 1931. It's published under SAGE. Um, we can take a quick look at the rank and trend. And we can see that it's been very, very consistent throughout time, right? Um, over since 2016, all the way to now. We can see this is rank number one. And then we can see that there are other 10 different types of journals, right? And more, and up to 1,300 journals in education. And maybe you can take a quick look at some of the journals. You know which one is probably the most relevant and pertinent, right? Because you can see that there's internet and higher education, there's computers and education. At the same time, there's child development and developmental re review. So not all education journals are the same, right? Obviously, it depends on what the application of it is. So you really have to ask, take a look at this and ask them which one is the most pertinent for your, yeah, for the, for the question that you have in hand. So I think that's actually a very good question. Um, I can't say that there are fixed um, parameters per se, but I can showcase to you what are the characteristics, the broad characteristics for a journal to be indexed in Scopus. And then this is how you can take a look at how the journals are ranked accordingly, right? And then you can take a, you can observe how well the journals have been performing. I will always encourage you to go to a journal homepage where you can find out more details about the aims and scope of the journal, the editorial board, et cetera, right? I think this hopefully should be able to answer your question. So it's approximately 3 p.m. right now, and I think that um, the questions have been really good. Um, I really like it. Um, yeah, maybe we can take one last question for the road. Well, if there are no further questions, um, this is essentially the, the link where you can claim, well, you can do your, your survey. And this is the link where you can, the code that you can use to claim your certificate as well. So otherwise, I think it's been an absolute pleasure um, engaging with you this Wednesday afternoon. Um, the metrics part may be a bit dry, but hopefully you'll be able to understand what the, metri the metrics are telling you and how you can leverage on it and how you can apply it. And hopefully you found today's session very useful and helpful. In the meantime, it's been great seeing everyone here. Um, do stay safe, do take care of yourself, to be healthy. I wish I was able to be in Penang to organize and to engage with you over this session in real life, but unfortunately it needs months. In the meantime, please do take care of. Oh, I see that there are more queries that are being typed into the chat box. So very quickly. So someone is asking, while downloading articles from Elsevier is a fee demanded. So I would say that um, the USLM library has subscribed to Elsevier very extensively, and you should not have to pay for most of the articles that you're reading for. For those articles that you have run into a paywall for, do feel free to approach the library and your librarians will be able to ask us, and I'm sure we can um, agree upon something, so not to worry, right? Uh, I wouldn't say it's demanded. I would say that when you go to an access content from any content provider, if you run to a paywall, you probably have to um, pay a fee to download it as well. But it's not for that all the articles that you're looking at because the USM library has subscribed to a very significant portion of content for you. So yeah. All right. So it's about 3.02 p.m. We've run shortly by two minutes. I hope everyone will stay safe and I'll see everyone here shortly. Take care, stay safe. I'll see everyone. Goodbye.